have left home in order for their children to get meat and bread. There are so many dehumanizing elements in the welfare system that we are concerned about removing. Ultimately, we are concerned about a guaranteed annual income. And the other thing I think it is very necessary to say is that everybody's on welfare in this country. And when it comes to black people and poor people, we just call it something else. When it's for white people and rich, we call it subsidies. It's no secret, fatherless households are more common in the black community. A survey from the American Consensus Institution revealed that 67% of black children under 18 in the U.S. live in homes without fathers. This is a stark contrast to white children, as only 24% of them live in fatherless homes. But it wasn't always like that. The black families survived generations of open racism, widespread poverty, and slavery. They lived through segregation and violence, and strong family bonds used to be the norm. As of 1960, two-thirds of all black American children were living with both parents. That declined over the years until only one-third were living with both parents in 1995. So it's not the legacy of slavery, slavery that destroys the African American it's the, it's family. The, it's, the, it's, the, it's the legacy of the welfare state. Between 1890 and 1950, the marriage rate was much higher among black women than white women. A fraction of black children lived in homes without their fathers. But everything changed with the expansion of the welfare state. It divided the household and created a dependency on welfare. This kind of reminds me of what President Reagan said. I've always felt the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So what happened? What's the mechanism? Here is a detailed look at how the welfare state played a role in the dissolving of the family structure over the years. People say that the breakdown of traditional family units, family structures, is a byproduct of black poverty. Not just because there is no man to support the family financially, but also because women tend to earn less than men on average. Of course, the connection between the two is there, but it goes deeper than that. Welfare was a mean little business. It was designed to get people by in a pinch. Public assistance programs, like welfare entitlements, have been a part of American culture since the 1940s. Unfortunately, like in many other aspects of government institutions, black Americans were left out. In time, black people could also get financial support, but it wasn't easy. Mothers who applied for checks had to let social workers inspect their homes to see if their conditions were suitable for welfare. These workers also had to make sure no man was living in the house. But even if they qualified for support, the amount they received was meager and not enough to build a stable life. In the early 1960s, welfare was not yet common, even in the most impoverished black communities. In the decade that followed, the number of black people on welfare went up by 169%. They further increased by 30% from 1970 to 1975. In 1972, New York City, almost one out of every six residents was on welfare. A major portion of these households were black. Although black people were only around a tenth of all Americans, they made up almost 50% of all welfare recipients by the late 70s. A recent UNICEF report showed that many children under 18 in America struggle financially, and African American children are nearly four times more likely to be in poverty than white children. Though the number of families receiving cash assistance has decreased since 1996, child poverty rates for black children in the US remain high. This outcome is not by accident. I studied the evolution of social welfare policies in the US from the New Deal to the 1996 reforms and found that these policies have been discriminatory from the start. And a lot of people can confess to that. This led many black families to fall into cultural and economic ruin. In a short period, healthy black people started relying on government assistance to achieve some level of normalcy. But within the city slums, that normalcy was impossible to get. Black children barely knew their fathers, and most were raised by unemployed and unmarried mothers stuck in a cycle of poverty and modest paychecks. This marked a significant shift in black American history. The consequences were severe for the next generation. Let's start with the Social Security Act of 1935. It was introduced during Franklin Roosevelt's administration. It was designed to create the safety net in the country, safeguarding families from losing their income. It was viewed as a significant part of New Deal reform and paved the way for federal protections in the future, such as the Affordable Care Act and Medicare. This policy had two main parts. The first part had social insurance programs that provided financial support to dependents of deceased or incapacitated workers and social security for retired older Americans. The second part comprised means-tested public assistance programs, initially known as Aid to Dependent Children, and later renamed Aid to Families with Dependent Children. 
In 1962, under the Kennedy administration, ideally, it was believed that as the overall quality of life in the country improved, more families could support themselves without needing financial assistance from the ADC program. Eventually, the ADC program would become unnecessary and gradually phase out on its own. But this posed a major problem for black Americans. Like any other component of the New Deal, the origins of the Social Security Act were deeply rooted in racism. During the 1930s and 1940s, black people had to deal with widespread racial discrimination in the workplace. They held low-paying jobs, often paid in cash and off the books. This made them ineligible for social insurance programs. The ADC program was an extension of state-run programs that supported widowed mothers but mostly benefited white widows. The states decided eligibility and need, and since the separate but equal doctrine was in place, blacks were still excluded from fully participating. Jim Crow laws and the separate but equal doctrine led to a system with different services for whites and blacks. But as we all know by now, they were far from equal. States made efforts to cut down ADC enrollment and costs. They proposed residency requirements to prevent blacks from the South from qualifying for the program. In 1935, there was a hearing on a bill, and the NAACP, an organization that fights for civil rights, expressed their concerns. Southern politicians wanted to exclude agricultural and domestic workers from the bill. This meant that many black workers couldn't get the support they needed. This exclusion would particularly affect black sharecroppers and cash tenants, who were already struggling to make ends meet. Even though the NAACP was highly against it, the Social Security Act was approved. That's why 65% of African Americans nationwide were not eligible for benefits, and an even larger percentage of these black families in the South were excluded from the program. In the 1950s and 60s, things got even worse for black families. Welfare checks incentivized single mother house Households, and there was one rule that ruined it all. The man in the house rule. Black families have long been the victims of income inequality and bad government policies. The irony, of course, is that conservatives pushed black mothers to break their families to get welfare. Before 1968, many states and administrative agencies created and enforced the man in the house rule. This rule basically meant that if there is a working or healthy man in the house, the government can't help you. And they would go as far as to send welfare workers to visit the homes without warning to check if a man was present. If they found any evidence whatsoever, families lost their welfare benefits. Over the years, the welfare state started dissolving the family structure, slowly but surely. A man who can't get a decent job and provide a substantial income suddenly believes that his family is better off without him. So, if a man were to lose his job, he literally had to leave the house so his children could get government surplus peanut butter, beans, and cheese. On the other hand, if either the woman or the man, or both, were irresponsible, they faced no consequences for their actions. And it was the taxpayers who ended up paying for it. These things aren't exactly designed to keep the marriage intact. They are meant to divide people. The harm done to the children was massive. Many children experienced the hurt from broken families at such a young age. In 1960, just 33% of black American children didn't live with two parents. But by 1988, that rate went up to 61%. In that time, the proportion of black children born to single mothers rose from 23% to more than 60%. This is exactly why we can't judge government policies based on their ideals, but based on their results. And these results, well, left a ton of households fatherless. I mean, think about it. What would the result have been if this welfare policy had required the opposite of that? That both parents live in the same home and care for their children to receive government assistance? The welfare state did what slavery couldn't do. It broke families apart and broken families fuel poverty. The structure of the family can influence the choices children make. For example, boys raised without their fathers are more likely to drop out of school, get violence, use drugs, or go to jail. Girls are more likely to have a child out of wedlock or engage in sexual activities at a very early age. These children are also more prone to mental health problems, which can affect them as adults. A psychology test detailed in Roy Baumeister and John Tierney's book, Willpower, showed that children from fatherless households were more likely to settle for a small prize straight away. In contrast, children with fathers present were more willing to wait for a bigger prize. Experts from the Northwestern Institute for Policy Research challenged that these effects are primarily due to dangerous neighborhoods or poor schools. They found that the direct effect of family structure itself played a more significant role. As marriage rates declined among the poor and working class in the US, the institution of marriage has remained strong among the wealthier population, with similar rates to those from 50 years ago. At the same time, the decrease in marriage among the working class has led to a significant rise in out-of-wedlock births, often to couples who are living together without being married. This happens because people view marriage as an ideal situation 
but feel it is unachievable, yet they still want to have children. In the mid-1980s, the rates of fatherless households dramatically increased. Today, just 44% of black children live with their fathers. Also, a lot more black children are born outside of marriage. The rates of such cases went up from 24.5% in 1964 to 70.7% .7 by 1994, which remains at a similar level today. Many people blame the expansion of welfare programs for the breakdown of black families. Since 1935, people have had access to cash welfare, but this welfare was quite modest and not enough to cover any of the living expenses. With Johnson's Great Society, which began in 1964, welfare benefits became much more generous and controlled. When I mean controlled, I mean crazy. The man in the house rule discouraged marriage because it provided welfare assistance to mothers if no man was living in the house. If a mother married an employed man, even one earning the minimum wage, it jeopardized her financial support. These benefits were huge. The Great Society programs offered a way out for low-income black families. This could be why, in 1964, only 7% of American children were born out of wedlock, compared to the current rate of 40%. So basically, the government urged mothers to keep fathers out of the home and paid them well for doing so. Shifts in the labor market and deindustrialization greatly impacted job opportunities, especially for low-skilled workers. It hurt both whites and black people, but black communities were the most affected. Here's an example. Imagine a city like Detroit, where the manufacturing industry was the top employer, and many black men held manufacturing jobs. Here, in the 1970s, 56% of black men were in the manufacturing industry, but by 2000, it dropped to 26%. Over the years, technological advancements and economic shifts created a demand for skilled workers in other sectors, like healthcare or technology. These new jobs required a higher level of education and specialized skills. The problem was the lower level of education among black men on average. As jobs increasingly required education beyond high school, black men faced many challenges. This made it harder for them to adapt to the changing job market and find new employment in other industries. White men were better equipped to handle the changing job market. They had higher education and a greater chance of securing well-paid jobs in emerging industries. Then there was the 90s gear change. In the late 1990s, efforts to reform the AFDC program took on more subtle forms of racism. Critics claimed that the program encouraged out-of-wedlock births, irresponsible fatherhood, and dependency across generations. During this time, there was a lot of public concern about the cost of welfare programs. Some people believed that the programs contributed to rising taxes and national debt. It tapped into public fears and created a seriously negative perception of people who received welfare. There were a lot of misconceptions and stereotypes about those who lived in poverty. So, the reform bill that was eventually passed replaced the AFDC with TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. The new bill imposed stricter work requirements, expecting single mothers to find work within two years of receiving benefits. There was also a five-year limit on receiving benefits. To promote traditional family values, teenage mothers didn't receive benefits. But that was not all. If a father were to fall behind on child support payments, they could face threats of imprisonment. The bill restricted the use of federally funded TANF for certain groups of immigrants. There were also eligibility limitations on Medicaid, food stamps, and supplementary social security income, SSI. These measures were just too harsh. They made it difficult for families in need to get proper financial support. Instead of addressing the root of poverty and creating new employment opportunities, it just punished those who already struggled financially. Well, today, modern problems require new solutions. According to Forbes, the economic status of black Americans is still far behind compared to white people in terms of stock ownership, net worth, income, home ownership, and other metrics. In the United States, black workers earn about 30% less than white workers. Almost 50% of black workers are working in retail, food services, healthcare, and accommodation. And a huge chunk of these workers are doing lower paying services. Imagine getting paid more than 40% less than white men for doing the exact same job. If you are a black woman in the US, this is more likely to happen. In 2020, black women earned around 58% of what white men earned on average. Similar to Latinas and Native women, black women face a much more significant pay gap compared to all women. This is because they face both racism and sexism in the workplace. Today, the social security program is a backbone for many black families. It protects them through disability, retirement, or death. The program is crucial because African Americans often lack financial resources and have higher disability rates. The program is meant to help those who earn low income get benefits. 
Those who heavily rely on Social Security are older black people with lower lifetime earnings and fewer pension benefits. For example, in 2017, 35% of married and 58% of unmarried older black people received 90% or more of their income from Social Security. Despite its importance, black Americans still benefit less overall from the program because of the ongoing pay disparities and shorter life expectancies. These factors result in lower lifetime earnings and in turn, reduce the total benefits received from Social Security. In 2005, President George W. Bush wanted to make some changes and planned to privatize the program. But the NAACP responded with a nationwide campaign called SOS, Save Our Social Security, and partnered with the Congressional Black to keep the program safe. It worked. Social Security is still an important support system for countless families. Unfortunately, our country has made very few efforts to reduce the disparities in wealth and income between black and white households. Despite laws against pay discrimination, black men earn 83 cents and black women earn 62 cents for every dollar earned by white men. Also, practices like redlining or housing discrimination have made it nearly impossible or much less profitable for black families to own homes. These structural barriers create fewer opportunities for black people to accumulate wealth and save for retirement. When the pandemic hit, Social Security became even more critical. Many black adults lost jobs, and many small businesses were forced to close. The coronavirus made it very difficult to keep up with mortgage or rental payments. The thing is, today, more black Americans are more likely to enter a church to go to a funeral than to celebrate a wedding. Fatherless homes, declining marriage rates, and high divorce rates are challenging the black community to the core. Imagine as a young child living in poverty with a single mother in a poor and drug-infested neighborhood. Over the years, you would have witnessed how this would impact your chances of success, like finishing high school and getting a good job. Because of this, many black children are raised with little expectations or a sense of hope. Now, some might argue that it takes a village to raise a kid, but in reality, the urban public housing village is drenched in toxic influences like violence, drugs, and bad role models. And in that village, fatherless boys are left alone to figure out what it takes to be a man. So, where do they look? To one another. And in many cases, they turn to gangs and the streets. Girls' lives, too, are deeply damaged in fatherless households. Without a father figure, young girls can experience psychological and emotional challenges. They can have lower self-esteem and struggle to form healthy relationships with men. Teen pregnancy is a common problem. They can also struggle with economic hardships and poor academic performance. For things to change, we need to acknowledge that the absence of black men is damaging countless households. To fill this void, it is essential to reunite fathers with their children, but also to teach the younger generation the value of family structures. But this is something that will take time and a lot of effort. All in all, the US welfare system is a clear reflection of its economic policies and the nation's long history of racism. From the very beginning, the policy excluded black Americans who were already struggling financially. The man in the house rule only made things worse which greatly impacted black households. The expansion of welfare led to a decrease in fathers' involvement in raising their children, leaving mothers to struggle alone in jobless poverty. This created a new reality for poor blacks, where work became optional, fathers were rare, and dysfunction became common. The lack of family loyalty and work ethic led to a new oppositional racial outlook among young black males who often resorted to crime. Now, years later, the impact of the rule can still be felt. A lot of black children have grown up without a father and they can easily go astray. The situation is hard for overworked and exhausted single mothers. The more children they had, the harder it was to get a job. I just want to point out the brutal reality that led to such circumstances. The welfare culture discouraged individual responsibility. It pushed people to make hard choices, which damaged their families and put everyone involved in challenging positions. This is a reality that many now have to live with. If you enjoyed this documentary, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. We aren't just telling stories, we're changing lives and waking the culture up. The video on the screen shares why they are banning black history in schools. Click on it now to watch. It will change your perspective on our history.